Chief for Research in the Division of Children's Primary Care at Duke University. He prepares and gives evidence-based summaries for the Secretary's Advisory Committee, and he'll be speaking to us today um, for the X-linked uh, uh, ALD. And I, mean, I think I get fascinated. He's very loved by the Secretary's Committee for his summaries and uh, helping get uh, the different uh, disorders added to our Rust panel. So I look forward to hearing his summary for the ALD. I feel like Madonna wearing this thing, which has been a lifelong dream of mine. Um, I, I have the danger zone for my presentation because I'm right before the break. And I was informed that if my presentation goes into the break, the break is going to get shortened. So that really puts the pressure on me, and I'm not going to get any love from the audience. So I uh, better go through rather quickly. So um, I'm going to be talking today about uh, newborn screening for X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy. And I, I think most of the people in this room know that this was something that was, um, uh, there we go. Oh, shoot, I broke it. That was obviously not the right button. <laughs> there goes your break. Sorry. There we go. Is it going to work now? No? Maybe not? There we go. All right. So, um, okay, this is my slide here. The, this is my spoiler alert. In February, uh, XALD was added to the recommended uniform newborn screening panel by the um, Secretary of Health and Human Services. So, um, I. I always like to begin these talks by backing up and just talking about um, criteria for uh, screening. And so uh, these are the traditional screening criteria uh, by Wilson and Youngner um, from the dating back to the 1960s. And just to summarize some of the key things, just so that this is all in our mind as I go through uh, how this was added, how this recommendation came about, is first of all, the condition should be an important health problem. So an important health problem can be something that's more common, but maybe not necessarily deadly, or something that's rare and very serious. It's just, you know, how important is it to society in general? Uh, the natural history has to be understood to, to some degree to understand what the benefit of identification and treatment is. There needs to be a latent or early symptomatic stage, so some point in time where you could hopefully um, identify um, the condition. There should be a test that's easy and acceptable and accurate and reliable. There should be a treatment that's also accepted, and the key thing is uh, more effective if started early. And um, diagnosis and treatment should be cost-effective relative to other services that we um, provide. So. Uh, let me transition and talk about the advisory committee. So the advisory committee on heritable disorders in newborns and children uh, provides guidance to the Secretary of Health and Human Services about the conditions that should, should be included in newborn screening. So the advisory committee itself doesn't add things to newborn screening. It's the um, uh, it, newborn screening, uh, again, as this audience all knows, is operated at the um, uh, state level, but informed by this recommended uniform screening panel, and it's the secretary that adds things on to the recommended uniform screening panel based on, uh, uh, in part, on advice from the advisory committee. So I just want to um, just highlight some of the key questions that, that we thought about as we did the review, and then, then highlight uh, the, the salient findings that led to the recommendation. So, you know, as is usual, we looked at the natural history and the epidemiology of X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy. We looked at the um, estimated incident rates uh, for the associated phenotypes of adrenal leukodystrophy in the typical course, and we looked at the factors that predict morbidity or mortality. Um, we looked at the direct and indirect evidence that newborn screening for adrenal leukodystrophy leads to improved health outcomes compared to what might happen with usual clinical care. We looked at the uh, analytic validity and clinical validity of newborn screening approaches to identify adrenal leukodystrophy. We looked at diagnostic methods that are out there that confirm um, uh, adrenal leukodystrophy uh, and the particular phenotype. 
Uh, we looked at methods that can predict what's going to happen with a condition. And then we looked at the harms associated with newborn screening for general leukodystrophy, both to the individual uh, and um, to the family. Although for our reviews, we really focus mostly on um, benefits and harms that accrue to the uh, newborn over the course of the newborn's life. Uh, then we look at a whole host of questions related to treatment and um, long-term follow-up, including issues related to the standard treatments, uh, whether or not there are protocols that would allow other people to know what they do when um, they're confronted with a potential case of adrenal leukodystrophy. Uh, we looked at, um, again, the harms associated with um, treatments, the impact of newborn screening uh, on um, uh, public health departments, newborn screening programs, and the population uh, as a whole. And then um, we look at the, looked at the feasibility of population-based screening for general leukodystrophy. So um, we're obviously uh, in, the, in the 20 minutes, um, and, and I'm sensitive to the break. I'm not going to answer each and one of those questions. I'm going to highlight, though, um, what I think are really sort of the important um, uh, takeaway point. So uh, adrenal leukodystrophy is a uh, proxosomal disorder caused by uh, mutations in the ABCD1 gene. Um, about 1 in 42,000 um, uh, males are hemozygous for the mutation, and uh, there's about 1 in 28,000 heterozygous um, females. One of the key things to recognize about adrenal leukodystrophy and one of the things that makes newborn screening um, challenging for the condition is that there is no genotype-phenotype correlation, no known genotype-phenotype correlation even within families, okay? So it's really hard to predict what the outcome is gonna be. There we go. So I'm just gonna review some of the different um, phenotypes that, that are described when talking about adrenal leukodystrophy. So the, the most serious form of it is the childhood cerebral form. Uh, uh, somewhere between 30 and upwards of about 60% of uh, hemozygous males will develop the childhood cerebral form. It typically presents uh, between 2 and 10 years of age, certainly more typically on the younger side of this um, spectrum. It's associated with um, rapid neurologic decline and death within about three years of the development of uh, overt symptoms. And the uh, treatment um, for the neurologic uh, involvement uh, currently is uh, stem cell transplantation um, that's uh, provided at the beginning of the progressive neurologic decline. Um, uh, it's clear that there's a certain point that you hit where um, transplantation is not going to stabilize the, the course of the child. Now, uh, as with uh, the other forms of adrenal leukodystrophy, the childhood cerebral form can also be associated with um, uh, adrenal insufficiency that can either develop before or after the onset of the uh, neurologic um, component. And Another thing that's important to recognize is that the stem cell transplantation does not treat the adrenal insufficiency. It's really for the neurologic decline that I've been talking about. And um, therefore, uh, even with stem cell transplantation, um, cortisol hormone replacement um, therapy is required and is required for the life of the, um, uh, the child. Boom, there we go. So, uh, Adrenomyeloneuropathy, or, or AMN, is a, a, a another form of the condition, another phenotype, and it's considered to be uh, more mild. It's associated with a progressive spastic uh, paraparesis. Uh, they can be associated with sensory ataxia. You can develop peripheral and spinal nerve uh, involvement. I have here, like in quotes, the, the typical age of onset being after 30 years of age. The problem is that, you know, it's hard to get to the epidemiology of these rare conditions, especially because um, it may often take a long time for these individuals to become diagnosed. And so, um, you know, it could actually be earlier. Nobody put it uh, together, and there may be individuals with it that um, uh, get missed. And for those of you who were at the advisory committee meeting when this was discussed or watched the videos, there was a, a, a gentleman there who told the story of 
you know, going from doctor to doctor before somebody um, figured it out and along the way getting, um, you know, back surgery and those kinds of things, which um, he, in retrospect, probably did not need. So again, these things can be hard to diagnose. Now, um, adrenal insufficiency can develop um, years before the onset of um, neurologic symptoms in um, AMN, putting um, these individuals at increased risk of um, death from that. And AMN is not treated with um, uh, uh, stem cell transplantation currently. Uh, treatment is um, supportive. Now, we did not focus a lot on um, uh, heterozygous um, females, and uh, part of this is because uh, they can, de although they can develop symptoms typically of AMN, they usually don't get it until much later in adulthood. Um, and um, because of that, it just wasn't a focus of our review because we were focused on what sort of happens more proximal to newborn screening. And you can debate whether or not that's right, but regardless, there's, um, you know, just uh, big gaps in data about this anyway. So. Let's talk a little bit about um, uh, newborn screening. Uh, it's based on the detection of uh, elevated, very long chain um, uh, uh, fatty acids. And um, so that, that's really what points you in the direction. That's what the newborn screening test is based on. Now, finding the ABCD1 mutation can be supportive of the um, diagnosis. And so, uh, for example, um, in, in it would make sense, you know, once you have an elevated, you know, confirmed elevated uh, very long chain fatty acid to go ahead and um, sequence the uh, gene. I say go ahead and sequence the gene as if I, like, would actually have any idea of how to do that, but I will remind everyone, especially when you come up with your difficult questions, that I'm a uh, general pediatrician. Um, that, that's my, like, disclaimer. I probably should have put that in the beginning. Um, and uh, follow-up for uh, uh, individuals after uh, identification of the very long chain fatty acids includes repeated clinical assessment, um, serial brain MRIs looking for um, neurologic involvement. Right now, the recommendation is to begin this um, at 12 months of age and then annually until um, three years of age, uh, uh, followed by every six months um, up to 10 years of age and then go back to annually again going to every six months during the period of time when individuals are at the um, greatest risk. Now again, adrenal uh, problems can happen anytime in there, and so these children need to have assessment of their adrenal functions, um, uh, of their adrenal function every six months for, you know, forever. So um, New York uh, uh, has been screening for adrenal leukodystrophy. I put up the numbers here from 2013 through 15, uh, during which they um, screened some um, 365,000 uh, uh, babies. And you can see just the numbers here uh, uh, going down. Um, of the 33 that were referred for conformatory testing, there were 13 males with ABCD1 mutations who are currently being followed. 13 heterozygous females. There was one male with uh, Klinefelter syndrome. I'm not entirely sure um, why he got picked up by screening. There are four with uh, Zellweger syndrome, um, which is uh, uh, another paroxysmal uh, uh, disorder, but it's really not the target of screening because uh, these children sadly have um, uh, you know, uh, death in uh, early childhood and there's no known uh, intervention at this time. But again, they'll be picked up by um, screening, and then a couple of other children who were incidentally uh, picked up. So extended family testing is offered to uh, children who are identified through newborn screening in New York, but um, uh, at the time we were doing the review, there was no data available about how many people took them up on this and what the outcomes of that screening was. Uh, in terms of outcomes um, in general, when you go back to the data, there's no published study that directly compares treatment outcomes for individuals detected uh, presymptomatically to usual case detection. Um, there's indirect evidence that suggests that early, earlier treatment with stem cell transplantation is associated with better outcomes. And um, we were able to find uh, no data regarding um, presymptomatic uh, detection of adrenal insufficiency. So one of the arguments um, that's often made is that if you can identify these children early, even uh, in the absence of doing anything about the neurologic outcomes, perhaps you can intervene and protect them from um, the problems associated with adrenal insufficiency. That's, that argu argument certainly may be true, but that we just weren't able to find um, data to support that one way or another. Uh, in terms of harms, there's the um, 
risk of false positives, which you know, occurs with every uh, newborn screening test. There's the risk of overdiagnosis, and by that I mean finding individuals who may not have any problems for uh, years or identification of heterozygous females who, you know, again, it may be many decades, if ever, that they develop symptoms. Uh, and then there's, of course, the issues related to stem cell transplantation. Um, uh, including morbidity and mortality and lack of available or suitable match. Now, regardless of whether or not someone's I identified pre-symptomatically or after the develop of development of symptoms that they had the childhood cerebral form, they're going to move on to stem cell transplantation. So the degree to which that's a harm is arguable, but there is a risk um, when you implement population level screening that there could be some kids that would be transplanted who may not have needed it. Um, this is a slide that just shows the projected uh, benefits uh, and uh, harms. And uh, let me just hit the, the key thing so I don't stand between you all and whatever is sitting out there for the break. Um, if you screen all 4 million babies born in the United States, you would identify about 143 newborns with an ABCD1 mutation compared to the 92 that would eventually come to usual clinical care. And the number of cases of the childhood cerebral form that would be detected would be similar in either case. Because remember, these, these children present with you know, pretty dramatic uh, uh, signs and symptoms. Um, but what you can do is shift things earlier so that the um, risk of mortality uh, would be lower. And again, I don't want to belabor uh, these slides. And I think many of you have seen this before. But during the break, if you want to talk about it more, please come and talk to me. Um, I always like to end these talks when we, start, when we talk about implementing a new newborn screening test is just thinking about the uh, implications of uh, how you put it into play. So there's issues of referral networks. What are you going to do when you identify a baby through newborn screening? How are you going to provide the stem cell transplantation? And the issue of data collection and monitoring to make sure that these children get the care that you hope that they get, as well as um, uh, identifying opportunities to improve our care delivery. Once you start systematically identifying children, it's an opportunity to refine care. So uh, I'll just end with two things. One is that, you know, the advisory committee has a, has a, a, a challenging job in terms of weighing this uh, evidence and, and, and decision making. So, you know, I have the fountain of youth on one side and the, uh, the, the fountain of bacon on the other, and you can decide which way you like to go. Um, and then this is a slide that, that I think many of you have probably seen me put up before. Anybody, so what's the bridge on the left? The Brooklyn Bridge, I, I can't like hear anything with my Madonna thing on the head, but Brooklyn Bridge, somebody said Brooklyn Bridge, right? Built in the 1880s, nobody thought it would stand. People were scared of it, giant suspension bridge. Um, uh, you know, five or six decades later, do you guys know what that other bridge is? It's the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, not the, not the Verizon, that one's in New York. This was in, um, uh, in, in uh, Washington on the other side. Uh, and um, it fell apart because it was uh, poorly built, even though people knew how to do it. And so I just put this up to remind people that if we're going to really implement this, we want to be more of a Brooklyn Bridge and less of a Tacoma Narrows Bridge, hopefully. So I'll end it there. And again, because it's break time, I'll be milling around here. And if you want to talk to me, why don't you come up and do it that way? Oh, we do have time? Oh, nuts. I'm going to use this thing. Anybody have any questions? Not after I promised a break. No one's going to ask me a question. OK. Go, go, oh, go. Now, Jeff Chensky from Baltimore. Great talk, for, uh, good for focusing. As you know, Baltimore was a hotbed for research in um, adrenal leukodystrophy, and we had a lot of discussions about this. I guess the problem you face is even if you identify the children and you're convinced they have the mutation, so they're certainly at risk for developing cl clinical symptoms, you're offering, in the, what used to be in the past, a much more severe approach to therapy with a lot of complications, including death as compared uh, to now, 
I guess hepatic stem cell transplantation has less severity, but still it scares people. It really scares them. And making the decision to do it is hard. And the question is, how many of the individuals actually were among the group who never would show symptoms? And is there any way of trying to get a handle on that and saying you're among the group that's likely to have symptoms versus the ones yeah, that are... Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. That's one that we really struggled with before. So sort of when do you know to um, you know, pull the trigger and do the transplant? Because we know that as you develop neurologic you know, signs and symptoms, you know, there, there's probably some sweet spot in there. And the risk of death associated with stem cell transplantation is you have this upfront risk. So if you survive your stem cell transplant, then you're likely to do very good. So like, you know, first few months survive your stem cell transplant, you're likely to do really well. Versus if you have the, ch the childhood cerebral, you know, onset, you're not gonna die right away, you're gonna die later. And so I think that, you know, figuring out where the sweet spot to do it is really difficult. The challenge that we faced when doing the evidence review is that the newborn screening could identify children who are you know, likely to go on and develop uh, adrenal leukodystrophy, but they, the cerebral form, but they haven't been followed long enough for us to even know that. So what we had to do was look at what was known about, for example, siblings who got um, transplanted. But there's, you know, there's probably something different if you're the sibling of a child getting transplanted versus uh, you know, just an unsuspecting parent um, having a child and being told this. So I think the jury's still out, and I, that's something that, that concerns me. We know from the uh, Crab A disease experience that there were parents who refused to um, have their child transplanted. Now, the benefit of transplantation for that condition is, uh, is you know, uh, a little bit more questionable. Uh, Nobody like, threw a tomato at me for saying that, so I'm, I think I'm in the right room. But regardless, I think this issue of what happens to children who are identified through newborn screening versus SIBs is a, is a very nuanced one, and we don't know the answer yet. So when do you pull the trigger? I don't know. So Alex, great talk. Very, I want to ask you something sort of a little bit more generic about the process that Certainly. the committee goes through. Um, not so much about the disease. So when you, when you consider whether to make a recommendation to add a disease to the RUSP, do you consider whether the therapies are adequately available in all the regions of the country? For instance, you know, just for example, Crabbe would recommend to be transplanted very early, for which there are many parts of the country that couldn't do that. Uh, in a reasonable time fashion, just in terms of the centers available, and you, you know, you get what I'm saying. I know exactly. So, and this is a push-pull thing So, do you ever too. is that a criteria? Is all I'm asking. So, I'm going to add one uh, caveat to to your question, which is again something that, that that I wring my hands about. I actually don't make any decision. I'm I have like plausible deniability in this whole thing. Um, it's it's the people who sit at the big table at the advisory committee. So. I, I say that because I already have enough of my a target on myself for other issues. So just, just to be clear about that. So I think that there's variation in how people think about it. Now, we are charged with looking at issues of feasibility of doing the test. So like, you know, is, can the test be done? But this issue about the availability of therapies, I don't think, I think that's still a, a work uh, in progress. What I think some people would say is, you know, if we wait till everything's available everywhere and in good shape, then nothing will ever happen. But then again, if we push people to do something and those issues haven't been resolved, then, and that's why I put that picture of the Brooklyn Bridge. I mean, I, I think this is a complicated policy thing. I mean, we still haven't resolved issues like treatment across state lines in many, many states for Medicaid covered children. We haven't resolved long-term treatment for individuals with metabolic disorders. And now we're talking about adding complex therapies on. I think that many in the advisory committee would feel like if we don't push, we'll never get there. But I remember there was one person in the advisory committee who was very concerned about the availability of, um, of transplants for minority children and that this kind of thing needed to be sorted out before it became a blanket recommendation. So I, I think different people feel differently, but I think that we need to be cognizant both of the availability of the screening test as well as the uh, treatments. And when I present this to the advisory committee, I try to highlight the complexity, but ultimately um, th this is one where I uh, 
you know, I'm not at the big table. Does that answer your question? Okay. Ronnie? I have to say, while Ronnie's going up there, I was gonna, I was gonna sing Ronnie's praises, yeah. but, uh, yeah. but my, my only you see what I did there, though? Get it? Let me do it again. I was gonna sing Ronnie's praises. No, no. Don't thank you, that. thank you, thank you. Oh, no, please don't, please don't do that. Um, uh, I, I think uh, the nutritionist sitting in there, I've been faced with their two or three patients asking for Lorenzo's oil, you know, and you know, even though evidence showed nothing. And when I was talking to the person involved who had done the trials, said, oh, because the patients were already damaged when they gave the oil. You know, it's like giving a PKU patient um, when a uh, formula when there's already brain damage. So this, we don't even talk about, I mean, I, I, th I hope we can talk more about the long-term follow-up data and collect data as we go along with different interventions moving forward yeah. with a new. I I can disorders. tell from so. having looked at the data, I, w I was unconvinced that Lorenzo's oil on its own was effective, but there's a trial going on now where they're combining um, Lorenzo's oil with transplant. So uh, yeah. uh, HST alone or transplant with Lorenzo's oil. But you're right, these are questions that need to be worked out through long-term follow-up. Because you know the families are asking when we pick up the positive cases of while they are waiting. I mean, does it help? So it's important we have this dialogue um, and think a little more beyond screening. I'm preaching to the choir here, but I wanted to get up and say something. That's right. Anything else? All right, it's break time. <laughs>